today, we get to celebrate Jesus, his presence and what he's doing. Today's a date on the calendar that is marked to honor moms. And I want to share with you a poem from an unknown author for all the ladies this morning. To those who gave birth this year to your first child, we celebrate you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss this year through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who work, who walk the hard path of infertility, fought with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are stepmoms and foster moms, adoptive moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance from your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who live through driving tests and medical tests and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. Amen, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> to those of you who have emptier nests, who will have emptier nests in this coming year, we grieve and we rejoice with you. <laughs> amen. Yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah. Where was this last year when we were getting ready for that? No. To those of you who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart and have real warriors, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you from an unknown author. This morning, yeah, it's a good. Those moments of time and things and, and such. And uh, I do just, some of you know, uh, I just put this out there so you know, some of you know our, our daughter's back from school uh, last week and some of you saw her last week. And this morning she is being announced uh, for the summer. She's actually gonna be a worship leader at Englewood Christian Assembly. She was hired uh, to be their worship leader for the summer and help with their direction. She has a, she's been working on her master, or her, uh, her major in music uh, and she'll make some shifts this year, but it's a, a blessing. So if you come and ask our family, so it's kind of a little different. Our kids are around and, and these things at different times as we get to celebrate, but we get to celebrate this morning uh, that she's being introduced and, and uh, taking this next step in her journey. So what a great reminder this morning we have of what a mother is and has many attributes and faces, right? This morning, I want to share with you from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And if you have your Bible, I would love, encourage you to turn there, whether paper or electronically. Normally, I don't have a message that is specific to holidays. But as I was reading through a book by the late Jack Hayford, I came upon an illustration that had me thinking, has had me thinking for several weeks. Sometimes you read books and um, you just got to plow through them. Um, I've, at this point, signed up to start my doctorate this fall because I've got an insanely mental issue, I think, some days, right? You know, those of you who have been there, no. But you, you pick up books and you just plow through them. But other times you pick up books and you've got to read and then marinate, read and marinate, right? This book from Jack Hayford speaks about the, um, speaks about our spiritual language. And I've been reading it for probably about the last two and a half months, because I could only read part of it and I'd be like, there was so much between scripture and then the understanding and Jack Haver passed away recently. But he shared this, uh, this illustration. If you've ever heard of the Mojave Desert, it's out there in mainly Southeastern California and Southwestern Nevada um, in the shadows of the Sierra Mount, Nevada mountains. And in the desert, there's this little 54 mile long river that's a tributary for the San Juan River. Other than where the rivers meet and small other areas, the Mojave River mainly is a dry riverbed. But if you were to walk through the desert and come upon this area, this dry riverbed, 
you would see it full of lush with flowers, greenery, and more. And you may ask yourself, like I asked myself as I was reading the illustration, how in the world does that happen? Even in the midst of a desert. Because it doesn't make sense on the surface, but that's where our minds take us. What is on the surface is not the reason why this vegetation is able to grow so well. You go to the next slide, I think is there, and it has, there you go. And uh, why the vegetation is not able to grow so well, because, but, but why it does grow so well is about 15 to 20 feet under the surface, there's actually a river that's flowing. The revived dry bed, riverbed may be dry on the surface, but underground there's this stream. Most describe it as a trickle of water that works its way through sand and rocks and pebbles, but it's able to sustain what is above. This got me thinking about two areas that I've been processing through. And a couple weeks ago, I was traveling with Ryan and we were talking and I said, man, I, I have this view of when we look around our church, we've experienced some, uh, some services where we've just really sensed God's presence moving. And, and sometimes and it, it's everything different and different times and, and different views and looks. And, and on the, the surface, you would step back and say, you know, is God moving today or does it have to look like this, right? In our mentality, in a Pentecostal mindset, we don't feel the spirit moves unless there's a word given or extended worship or something along that line. But, but why has that become our standard when, when really the spirit of God is moving in so many ways? I thought about this even this week, that even after service last Sunday, somebody came up to me and uh, they were, they asked me to, they said, I, I have a hernia and I'm meeting with the surgeon this week to plan for a doctor for the surgery. And, if, and I said, well, just put your hand where it's at. And I'm, I'm just sitting over there after service. And I said, just put your hand where it's at. And so we did. And when I just prayed, Jesus, would you just heal my brother? Just a very simple prayer. I was even more thinking about getting home to getting all my final stuff packed up and getting on the road headed to catch an airplane to get out of town. And I just prayed that simple prayer. I, I believed I joined because it says we're two or more gathered in the midst. There am I in the midst of them. You know, gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. In the middle of this week, I got a message from the individual who says, Pastor, I went to the surgeon this week, and the surgeon said, that area is strong. You don't have to have surgery. You're like, wow. And you just step back, and you step back, and you'd be like, I mean, Oh, you know, in my weakness, in my lack of faith and all these things. I mean, you have faith, you stand there and you agree, you do all these things. But in the midst of that, God plan and purpose, what I didn't see on the surface, God was able to do because of the river and his presence. And I hear the stories and I see some of the things some people tell me of the testimonies of what God's doing in their life or what happened when they're at work or a financial blessing or whatever. And you, you kind of step back for a moment and you, 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 on the surface on a Sunday, it looks like this, but in that moment, somebody's life may, the Holy Spirit may just turn a knob or turn something in somebody's heart and life. And I have to step back and say, well, when does my definition become the definition of the Spirit moving? And when did my preference of how I expect God to move, when did that become the standard by which we operate in? And I thought about that, like I'm expecting to see the surface thing, but doesn't the Bible say in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that it's for we walk by faith, not by sight? What a lack of faith to be able to be that I have to see it with my own eyes to know that it's happening. Because as your pastor, there are things that I can't control. There are things that I want to see. There are things that I, I want to, but, but I can't control the outcome, but I can, as the pastor, help to guide and make sure the environment is right for God to move. And when I help to lead that, then we see lives that are changed at the core coming to the outward presence of what God wants to do. It's like our work in Puerto Rico. We've been working on this Bible college building, but because the college is now online, they went from uh, 10 students in 2019, they provide all for the Caribbean, uh, all the Caribbean islands, uh, this Bible college. They have almost as many, uh, they have 185, 
uh, or churches in just the island of Puerto Rico. And across the state of Ohio, we have 282, but the number, like the number where they're reaching, what they're doing is so much grand. And so they, they only had 10 people in their Bible college in 2019 when the Javier took it and moved it online. Today, they have over 250. In the next couple of weeks, they'll be graduating 75 from their Bible college with their, either their bachelor's or their master's in biblical studies. And so it's all online. So they have this building that's there at the compound. And because the college is empty, you know, is empty because of the online, they have these dorms, but then they have these classrooms. And we worked on building these things. And the, the vision came to them that because of the uh, agendas that are happening, the woke agendas and everything else taking place in society, which... Um, which we know is going to happen biblically because it's going to, it says, scripture says we're going to be headed in this direction. But the question is, how do we stand up and do it? So how do we respond? Um, the response that they're doing is saying, we're going to start a school for first to fourth graders because kindergarten is a thing in Puerto Rico that has to be maintained. But we'll start uh, first to fourth grade and we'll begin to uh, raise up this next generation. And then while we were there, they've talking about taking another area, those that were with me, there's the, where the women were staying in the dorms, they actually have a meeting with somebody with a preschool that would come in and actually put a preschool in this place as well. So the, co the school will house 60 students in it that we just worked on, and then the preschool will have another, so 120 kids on this area, and Pastor Tom's working with BGMC and Convoy of Hope to try to get a playground that we can build down there and continue to invest and, and to bring about a change, but we create this environment that will allow the Holy Spirit to freely flow into this next generation, raising up a potential of 120 kids. See, there's this underground riverbed of what God is doing there, and in the midst of the surface right now, the spaces are amazing and finished, but the long term is that the changed lives that will happen because of what, we dis what, was being, what will be discussed in those classrooms and the lives that are ultimately going to change as we build a generation that serves the Lord. See, this then not only leads me, not from a revival in the surface standpoint, but also leads me to the second area of thought in regards to this dried up riverbed. Moms, this is where you come in. But it's not just today for the moms. So, man, I want you to think about this, and everybody in this church, young people, to think about this as well, because this is where we all kind of fit into, where we all fit into this picture. My wife Stacy and I have experienced the benefits, the blessings of this, especially over the last several years, as our children have grown up and moved out, um, you know, there's moments of joy and there's also moments, moments of tears and sadness. But, you know, it's fun to hear that our kids may repeat something that we said to them back in the day. And Stacy and I look at each other and we're like, wow, they were listening, you know? <laughs> like, maybe not then, but now you're like, oh, yeah, they did listen. While this direction of thinking was a focus on the moms, I, I can also speak today to the church that is all of us that we're called to walk the principles that I want to share with you this morning. First, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 3 is where we're at. And uh, I think I, maybe I said 6 earlier, but we're at 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 6, we'll begin there. It says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God has caused the growth. Was causing the growth. Then, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9 For we are God's fellow workers. I'm sorry, this is 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'm doing really good this morning. Listen, I am reading the Word of God, see, because I. I got that part down. That's right, Jeff. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter, I, I was in the right place. Obviously, you weren't in the spirit. Okay, let me start over. I mean, it's on the screen. Did I say second up there? I even said second up there. Wow. Josh is really good this morning. Lack of sleep. Lack of, can you, Lord, I just pray for mercy that if you're ever in this seat, you'll have this. No. First Corinthians chapter three, verse six. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither... The one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. 
According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12, now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Many road trips in our family were through different portions of our country, different places that we've gone. And my wife would say many times, hey kids, look at the corn. What did mom say? The farmer planted it. God sends the rain and grew it and, and the farmer gets to harvest it. This is so true as we look at the future of the church, the future of Christianity, the future of where we are headed, that this generation of young people, Generation Z, those that are 11 to 26 years old, and Gen, uh, Generation Alpha, which are zero, not even born yet, but up to the age of 10 years old, and 2025 20, will be the end of this one, will, are being raised. And, and what is the outcome that we want to see in their lives? Remember their illustration that what is on the surface is not always the true picture of what is going on underground. Moms this morning, church this morning, think about this. In verse number six, it says we are called to, we are really called to invest into this next generation. We have the opportunity to plant a seed, the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will then have an opportunity to turn on the sprinkler of water in the lives of those that we are investing in, challenging and discipling them to take what is seed and grow. But God ultimately, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is able to allow that seed to grow, to become what it needs to become. Some of us have the wrong definition of what the church is required to do or responsible to do. The church that is you and I, those that teach, those that, are, that develop and deploy, our job according to Ephesians 4, 12 and 13 says, we are to equip the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Our job is to stir up within you within us to help us grow in our walk with God, to become more like God. We're not called to be the, I'm not called to be your soul feeder or your, your spirit of the, you know, the spiritual body and life of who you are. I'm not called to do that. Just like you, like the work of a trainer at the gym, you can only push, they can only push you to do so much. They encourage you on the weights and the exercises and the things that you're supposed to do, but ultimately it comes down to you and your responsibility to manage what goes over your lips and into your mouth and how much you'll continue on using what they've given to you, the tools, the maintenance of the plan that's been there. I can encourage you today, I can, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, to, to take what's been dropped as a seed with inside of you and, and help to, to breathe some fresh life and, and breathe into that. But ultimately, it's God who causes it to grow. But the question is, like, if, if I'm the only one, if the pastor, if all you're doing is reading the Bible with us in these verses on Sunday morning, you're missing so much more of what God can do and wants to do in your life. As followers of Christ, we have the blessing then to be able to follow Christ, that he is the one that causes the growth in our lives. Verse number seven gives us an emphasis even further that we may have a role, but we are not the main thing in the person's life. We are called to disciple, but we're, we are called to not, I, I'm not walking around, I shouldn't be walking around with a baby bottle and you've been going to this church longer than I have. It's time that we, we learn to eat the meat. It's time that we learn to grow up, that we stop the same things that have been affecting us in the past. If you still have an, an anger problem in your life, it's not everybody else's fault, it's yours. If you're offended by what you watch on television, it's not the television's fault, it's your fault. You're allowing that junk to be, continue to be filled into your life. 
you learn and grow and suddenly you decide to turn it off and say, I don't need that junk anymore. Somebody does something, cuts you off. What's your response? You're, you know, what do you do? Just like in Puerto Rico, you just stop. I mean, I've, I've, I've never seen, I was the first time in three trips that I've seen an accident and it was the first time the other night. And because all these people, it's like you drive offensively and defensively at the same thing. It's very interesting. People just pull their nose out. I mean, you could be going down the main road and people just pull their nose. I found a new stop sign that's been there every time I've been there, but I've never stopped at it. Because when you go through a stop sign, you just put your hand up and yell, freedom, and just go right through it. That's what they do. They had eight months of no power. <laughs> But you, you, you have to begin to walk these in. I know it's sometimes joking and saying these, but the, but the opportunity that we, if you're still struggling with the same things that were there many years ago, friend, you, you got to grow up. We expect our children to grow and to do all these things, but most times they're just modeling what they're seeing from the adults that are in their lives. You tell your child not to lie, but it's all right after you call in sick when you're not sick, or you tell them to do these other things when you're, you tell them you can't do this. Do as I say, not as I do. See, it's God that does the work in our lives. This should allow for a great sigh of relief that the outcome in somebody's life, the outcome of your life is not my, you know, it's, it's, there is a responsibility, but ultimately the outcome of your life is not my responsibility. Well, you're the pastor, we pay you to do this. If you have that mentality, you're missing the plan of what God's going to do and what he wants to do in your life. Because ultimately you're going to stand before Jesus by yourself, just like I will. And I will have to give an account, as we talked about last week, the seven judgments and how we have to give an account for the life that we've, we've lived. And I, you're saying, well, this is, Pastor, I thought you were preaching a nice Mother's Day message. Usually as pastors, we're very nice to the ladies on Mother's Day and we just rip apart the men on Father's Day. Ladies, I'm going to tell you, stop gossiping. Stop saying, well, can you just pray about sister so-and-so? They, you know, and you're like, I got a prayer request. And you tell her about it. This is just gossip. Idle hands leads to bad ways. These things like stand, we stand up. We walk in righteousness and godliness and holiness. We model this because there's an all-out attack on the women of today. And friends, if the church can't figure out how to be women of today that are biblical and godly, then how do we expect the world to be okay with it? The outflow of, really, the outflow of what we're seeing happen on the national platform is because what's under the groundwork in the, the river, the dried up riverbed inside the church is most people don't, you know, there's, I could probably go across this room and several people would say, well, I can prove that there's more than two genders. And I said, well, then let's go back, you know, go back to the beginning or there's these understandings of all these things. And it's like, if we can't figure this out and have a standard and understand what God's word says, then how is the world going to be able to look at us? Like, we've got to understand these things. We've got to walk these things out. And, and, and I know sometimes that's not politically correct, but who gives who cares? Well, that's not popular. Great. Who cares? I want to stay. If you don't stand for anything, if you don't stand for something, you're not going to stand for, you know, you don't stand for nothing. You're going to stand for anything or whatever. You're just going to stand up and do whatever. And I can't even got the line there. You know what I'm saying. Just get frustrated by it, right? You just get frustrated by like, how can we get to this place? Because we have got to look, what is the seed that's been deposited in our lives? And then what's the seed we're depositing into the next generation? See, there's this place where that, that it doesn't mean that we plant the seed and walk away. Because by, while it's not our responsibility, it's also we plant the seed and we still invest. We don't just walk away, but we partner with God in what he has in store in individuals' lives. My job as pastor, our job as our staff and leaders and our, our group leaders is to come alongside and help you get through the season that you're in to the next season that God has for you. 
to help you where you're at and to encourage you and to speak life and, and to just help bring some life into that moment, blow onto the fire a little bit so you can make it down the road of where God takes you in this journey. There's this verse, in verse 8 it goes into that, now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. There is unity that comes when we as a church, when a mother and a father join together to raise up the next generation, there's a reward that is given and bestowed upon you for your participation and responsibility. Men, your job is not to just be the, fertilize, the fertilizer of the seed at the birth, the conception of that child. I guess I did say that. Thank you, I heard the, the Snickers. And you just say, hey, I'm, I'm a dad, I'm good to go, friend. No, it's, it's having to participate more in that child's life, that the role of a dad is to stay engaged in participating all the way through that life, that your role may change from dad to coach, but you still have an influence and you're involved in the lives of your kids. The rewards, as I said, of parenting, uh, I talked about that, that your kids get it. Stacy and I have looked at, I've used our thing here, we've looked at each other at times and said that we, we, we've raised our kids right. And sometimes she's like, please don't talk about all this. But, but friends, we've got to talk about the fact that, because all we really hear about is how all these kids that are going in this other direction. And I'm like, we've got to stand up and say, I understand that may not be your story, but our story is let me tell you about God's plan and purpose and how he rescued us and that my kids didn't follow my steps or her steps. And she grew up in a family that served Jesus and multiple generations of ministers, I didn't have that. But that, that the family tree was shifted, that the generation was shifted to see what God could do and that, that our kids aren't, you know, a bunch of messed up pastor's kids like so many others are. One of my our mentors, one of our college, of the pastors at Brownsville Revival, Brother uh, Robertson, he, um, he named his dog Deacon. It's a cute name, yeah, a cute name. The deacons didn't like it when they came over in the deacons' wives when he said, deacon sit, deacon quiet. They thought that was offensive, but that for him, he's like, it was the one place I told the deacons or the board, quiet, sit. You know, but, but that was, but there's sometimes so many things and so many times these kids, just because, you know, they, they see the ins and outs and I'm just thankful that uh, my daughter called one point and said, I've been looking for a church and I'm just, and I'm talking to people and I just realized how healthy of a situation we've had through the years because I hear all those messed up stories of these other kids. We said to each other early on that if our kids feel called into ministry, whatever that looks like, be in the business world, be in the, the ministry, missions, whatever. And they, if they say no because of what's happened to them throughout the years, then we missed the mark. We didn't protect them. Through the pastoring, it wasn't we were hiring two for one. They didn't get both of us for one. Like my job is to hear she was raising our children many times when I was helping to raise the sheep in the church. That was a decision we made. But we've, we've rejoiced and we've seen the blessing and the reward of our parenting, more hers than mine. That they have their own jobs, their own cars, and they pay their own bills. Come on, parents, you know what I'm talking. Sweet Jesus. Ah. One's back right now, you know, moved back in. She moved back in and we're like, oh, our food budget's gonna go up again. And let me tell you, if your kids are still at home, hold on because your deliverance is coming, friend. <laughs> it's not that we wanted them to leave, but we want for them what the plan and purpose of the Lord has been for them. And that seed that was planted has been invested in and grown. And through our, not only through our influence, but through the influence of the other pastors in their life, through their teachers, their coaches, their church family and more, and through the, through the Holy Spirit has been allowed to speak to them and has been allowed to take that seed and grow it into what he has had for them. Friends, as a church, when we dedicate little ones, I ask the church, are you willing to disciple and create an environment for this child to have an understanding of the gospel and the power that is in the gospel? 
And we, we have the responsibility to help raise, but to not only help raise, but to help create an environment to develop for this next generation. When you give and you tithe to Kettering, it allows us to have a great kids pastor, a great kids ministry, great volunteers. It allows us to have a great youth pastor as we're in the process to look to hire, to have a great student center to, re to develop the next generation and to help them recognize God's potential and call upon their lives. That's why we're getting ready to do major renovations to this property, to prepare this for this generation, but yes, also for the generations that are yet to come. And according to verse 8, it says that when we do these things, when we make these investments, when we water the seed, when we not only plant, but we partner with God in what he wants to do, it says that we will be rewarded for what we've done, for our labor, and might I also ask for that which we give. But like, I like verse number nine. It says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. We're God's fellow workers. It doesn't, doesn't say that God does the whole thing. We get to be a part of what God's doing. I love it to be a, on a front row seat of seeing all that is happening. See the development, see the changes, see what God's doing, hear the stories, hear the testimonies, hear the, the questioning of the, the times. People will email me questions at times and ask different highly spiritual things. And I'm like, oh, I have to really work. Thank you for emailing because I can work on them, kind of think about it. But, but we work through these things. I get to see those minds churn and see that life change, get a front row to that. We get to not only receive our reward later, but we get to re receive the reward in the making. While I was writing this, uh, uh, I, I thought about, it's like making chocolate chip cookies. There's a true reward of eating that cookie when it comes out of the oven nice and hot. But there's also a front row reward as you're making those cookies. It's called the cookie dough. Right? You're like, one for me, one for there, you know? I don't acknowledge that I eat that because of the eggs and all that stuff, but you can take your own responsibility. But, but see, we get the blessing of not only the end result, but we get the blessing along the way. The blessing of this life is not just heaven at the end, but it's a life well lived all the way through. It's the opportunity to walk alongside somebody and, and see their life change along the way to see God move, to see his hand, to see them make a decision that, that when, we're, when we're talking, one of the questions that came up with one of the candidates that I was asking for you, like, what do you want to see? Is it, is it about having a large youth group? And I said, no. I said, I, I, yeah, it'd be great to have more students and all these things. I said, but I want some depth to our kids. I want to be able to stand that when they're in a classroom and they have to make a decision and they're faced with one way or the other, that they go back and, and that the Bible even comes into their mind about, well, this is what the word of God says and this is how I should respond. That's what I want. I, because if you, don't, if you don't want that, there's plenty of other churches that can do that, but we'll stick with the word and what he said, what the word says. But the second part of that verse is, we are God's field, his building. This is the environment of his presence and his glory. As a field, we can be rich soil that anything can grow in, or we can be the nasty, rocky soil that nothing grows in. I don't know about you, but I want to be the rich soil and that whatever God plants can grow. And a building is, is a tool that God uses to spread and further the gospel. Not only do we look at this place as a church to be utilized by the ministries and others that we can present the gospel and all these things, but I, I people, oh, we went off there for a moment. I want to be available to be a place, a person that, I want to be available to be a place that a person that God can, and a person that God can use to spread his power and his presence that, that we can say, wow, we were called to be, make us a sanctuary of his praise of who he is and all these things. There's something about a building being strong, right? Not only does a field bring life, but a building brings security and protection. I look then in verse number 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. I'm thankful for the grace that God has given me to walk with him, but also to make mistakes while I am with him. We're not always going to get it right, but the grace and mercy of God 
will bring us back into alignment with him. In the lives of this generation, in the lives of our children, we have the opportunity to lay a foundation in their life. This is what everything else will be built upon. A couple weeks ago, I taught in our youth service, the, the first two weeks ago, I taught on Wednesday night, and I, I spoke about foundations. I alluded to it a little bit last week, but there was a phrase, a line that I used in that message that says that the size of your foundation determines the size of the house that can be built. The size of your foundation determines the size of the house that can be built. Some of you want this grandiose thing, but if you're not willing to take the time to build the foundation, that thing will never stand. Our kids that night had marshmallows and, and pretzels and stir sticks and all these different things to try to make this, this tallest item and the tallest tower out of marsh, you know, different size marshmallows and all that. And I challenged them and they had all like all these things all over the place. It was, it was quite grand and funny. And if we weren't eating it, we'd eat the, the marshmallow as well if it fell over. But, but the biggest thing I said, you know, if it goes back to building a strong foundation, they were able to build something taller. These big buildings don't just have a, a four-inch foundation of concrete poured below them. They've got feet of, of concrete and all these things. And friends, we've got to take the time to build the foundation. And that's why, that's why we do kids ministry and youth ministry and where we have discipleship classes. That if only you only show up on Sunday morning in the services, you're missing the opportunity to be discipled and to grow the foundation in your life. So that when the wind blows... They're, down in Puerto Rico, they're cutting down the coconut trees because they, they topple over very easily during the hurricanes. They, build, they want to plant trees that have deep roots that can stand the test of winter. And the test, not test of winter, but the test of the winds. You drive around here after a big windstorm comes down and you see certain trees that are just whole swaths of earth that just get pulled up in those trees because their roots are only within the top 18 inches, but yet the tree's really tall. Those, some people, you look good on the outside, but what's underneath? What's the depth? What's the foundation? See, what can ruin a foundation? It's the, uh, one of the things that ruins the foundation in, our, in our, our lives, but at our homes or, you know, where we build is it depends on what material you put around the foundation when you fill it back in. Who do you surround yourself with, your friends and the people you hang with? That can determine how your foundation will main, remain strong. And the other thing that causes foundations to, one other area that causes them to be weak is if you don't let them fully cure. So if you don't, if God's trying to process this through in your life, but you want to jump ahead because you're not patient, the foundation becomes weakened. Bible College, I applied for a lead pastor's position up in the UP there, hey, way up north, you know, in the UP of Michigan. But I think if I would have done that, I wasn't ready for that. And we got those things. People walk into situations. I wasn't, it took me all these years to be prepared so that I was ready for what I came to here at Kettering. If you hired somebody, if you had hired me 10 years ago, I went to, we went to be in the place where we are today because I wasn't ready to be in that place. But God was building a foundation, preparing me and preparing you for what was to come. The size of your foundation determines the size of the house that you can build. As parents, we get the opportunity to lay the foundation. Mom, most likely you will be the one that will lead your child to Christ. That doesn't mean that you're the only one, but most times you are the one spending most of the time with these little ones. And you will most likely get the opportunity to be that blessing to lead them to Jesus. See, we get to start the foundation and head them in the right direction, introducing them to Jesus, starting and planting the seed in their life. But, but you set it up so others can help you then build upon that foundation. In the church, it's other pastors and teachers in classrooms and parents and others that invest. We do this when we send our kids to school. We train them as they are growing up to learn these things. But then teachers and coaches and employers and such, they're the ones who then build upon the foundation that you've given to them. And it's important then that we set the right foundation in our kid's life and create the right environment if they're going to make it the rest of their life. 
We need to set the course and direction, staying involved in the lives of our kids, not letting social media raise our kids. And back in my day, right, letting MTV raise your kids. But in taking up the, our, we, we, we train them in taking up the God-given authority that you, have, that you have been given to set the foundation so that when they face the trials, that when they have a, that they have a firm foundation in God's word, that they know his power, what it does, and they know what his presence feels like. Friends, if we take our kids to the mountaintop in worship and and these opportunities, if we give them opportunities to pray people for people and they see miracles happen before their eyes, their lives will be changed forever. They'll go back to that place and say, wow, I remember when God moved in that time. Can I implore you today to not wait and to start the foundation today, no matter how old your kids are, give them the hope for the future that you have, that the word of God speaks to. Give them a leg up, the best opportunity to make it through this life, not on their own, but be with him. To do this, we have to have the foundation in our own lives. One of my professors at school said, you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. You teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. You can't give something that you do not have. If you want your kids to have a strong faith in Christ, then you have to have a strong faith in Christ so that you can model it for them. Don't expect, well, Pastor Tom has my kids, you know, on two hours a week, uh, you know, an hour and a half on Sunday morning and, a, and an hour on Wednesday night. That's only two hours out of a full week. Out of a full week, that's a hundred and some hundred and four hours a year. The remainder of the time is you. It's your, and you're like, oh golly. And if that frightens you, then we have a Bible study that meets on Wednesday nights. We have a discipleship classes that meet on Sunday mornings during church. We will form, if you want to learn, we will form men's groups. We'll, we'll keep doing that to invest and help you to grow because that's, if we can invest and stir that fire with inside of you, we know that they're going to be changed. We'll keep pushing and pushing and pushing because and, and, it's not something you can say, oh God, would you please? You mean like you, you don't pray to him any other time except over your meal and you say, oh God, could you move in my kid's life and poof, something changes or poof, something happens. You go to bed one night and the next morning you wake up and your life is completely different. I mean, God is able to do that, but most likely he's going to be working on your foundation of what he wants to do and you need to build it. Because verse 11, it says that, that for no man can lay in a foundation that the other one has laid, which is Jesus Christ. It's the foundation is what matters. The foundation that counts for all eternity is Jesus Christ. It's not being financially stable. Yeah, that's great. That's all these things. But it's the foundation that we have to build is upon him. Because what does it say in verse 12? That now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, what does it say in each man's work will become evident. It's not the gold, it's not the silver, not the precious stones, the wood, the hair, the straw. It's, well, it's like the three little pigs was something that we celebrate as the house that was built that the big bad wolf came from. Friend, there is a big bad wolf that will huff and puff and try to blow your house down. And the only thing that will stand is the ones that are built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Even if it's not popular, Jesus is the foundation that we need and the only foundation that we can truly stand, that can truly stand against whatever comes our way. We may not like what's happening around us in our life, but the question is, what is the foundation that you've built? I stood in the hospital room yesterday with Dave, and we talked about what is happening on the surface but in the depths of that 15 to 20 feet below the surface in his life. He said, Pastor, I'm worried and I'm concerned. I don't know what's totally going on. He said, but he knew the word. He knew the word as it flowed out of his mouth as he, even as he said that, and I said, listen, to to be a fear and worry is, is human. 
but to have a dependence and some foundation and the depth of Jesus Christ was going to carry him through. That's why he could stand there and tell jokes or lay there and tell jokes. That he could do all these things, even with the unknown about what's ahead, was able to sit there and say those things because of the foundation that was in his life. He didn't wait till the moment when suddenly something bad was happening that he began to prepare at that point. He'd been preparing his whole life. That when a nurse or somebody else walks in the room, that he's able to not fake it, but he's able to, this is, the, this is what flows from his mouth. It was a foundation that was built upon Jesus that was able to stand he may not like, and we may not like the outcome, depending on what the tests come back. But there's a man's story that we will tell of a foundation that's been built and that is maintained of God's power and his goodness. See, the quality of your foundation, the work that you do to build will ultimately be determined in the end days. Will it burn in the fire or will it stand the test of time? Moms, Church, we have a responsibility to this generation and to the next one. We state this in one of our five core values that we have as a church. It's called legacy. We believe the foundation and the future of our church is unified in love to reach, teach, and impact all generations to come for the call of Christ. It's not just about where we are today, but it's about what's about to come and what God wants to do and how we continue to invest See, in this, that we know that Proverbs 22, 6 is our responsibility to train up a child in the way that he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Moms, I want you to hold on to this promise for your child that is on the journey right now that you didn't set them on. They may be wandering a little bit right now. But I want you to grab a hold of this verse because in this verse that you've trained them up in the way that they go. And when they're old, they would say, we'll not depart from it. Read the story of the prodigal child, how that happens and comes back. That if God can do it in that situation, he can do it in yours. Church, let's hold on to the fact that we must invest, that we are investing and will continue to invest in this and future generations so that the gospel will be preached and it will go forth and lives will be changed as people come to Christ. We may not see the river on the surface, but know that God is stirring hearts and lives to surrender to him and that the beauty on the surface is about is what we're able to push through and to see. Moms, I want to encourage you today. Happy Mother's Day. I want you to continue to, if I can add this word, keep on momming. Church, keep on being the hands and feet of the gospel to the world around us. We have a purpose and God has a plan. Let's make sure that both of those happen in our time and that we are part of the outcome as we walk through everything that he has. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning. I thank you for moms. I thank you for spiritual moms, mentor moms, all those that are in this church today. I thank you, God, for the things that you're doing in people's lives and how you're working under the surface, that even though we may not always see it on the surface, that you're working underground. Lord, I pray that the foundations that we build, the things that we're encouraging, the seeds that we're planting, Lord God, that we'll see the harvest come and that we can have a front row seat as we walk through this, as we partner and labor with you. God, I pray that it's in this room today where questioning where we are and what we're walking through and the things that we're experiencing. I pray, God, that you will reaffirm and affirm within our hearts and our lives the call, the plan, the purpose that you have. Lord God, as we stand for something, we stand for the gospel, we stand for what you're doing. Lord, I pray blessings upon all those in this room today, those that are watching, that we would know um, our role in building the foundations and our role in planting seeds and God, above all, we trust you and we look to you today for the hope that we have of the future. Lord, we thank you today for your goodness and your mercy. And we bless you today in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said.